Uh, my name is Richard Means, and I'm one of the member, uh, members of the planning committee uh, for today's events. On behalf of Americans for Democratic Action, the Illinois League of Women Voters, Unity Temple, Oak Park Temple, and about 30 other sponsoring organizations uh, that are listed on your program today, uh, we welcome you. We're proud of our turnout today and proud of our program. Uh, we'll be talking about history with some of the people who were there making it. We'll be talking about the challenges ahead to guarantee voting rights to all who are entitled to them. Uh, the battle is still going on for voting rights. Uh, a little after 4 a.m. Chicago time yesterday, the United States Supreme Court issued its order to allow the state of Texas to implement its voter ID requirement, which the uh, United States District Court in Texas had ruled was intended to discriminate against African Americans and Hispanic citizens. And also that court ruled that it was an unconstitutional poll tax because of what it cost people to get the required voter IDs. Judith Brown Dianis uh, will tell you more about the continuing litigation. And there are, is a lot to talk about today, and so we won't delay any further. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Reverend Alan Taylor, who is the Senior Minister of Unity Temple Unitarian Universalist Congregation. Thank you, Rich. And thank you to all of you for taking out your afternoon of this gorgeous day to be here for this extraordinary event. Um, on behalf of Unity Temple, I welcome you all here and uh, I can say that it's quite an honor for me to be here. Uh, in fact, the first two speakers, I happen to have uh, some type of relationship. One, I've been on the handball court with Don, register. And I don't, didn't even know of some of his work in the past. And then a fellow Unitarian Universalist at First Unitarian Chicago. I am so excited to hear of your work, Tim. Thank you. And all of you, we have a great uh, few hours here, two and a half hours to learn from one another. May this teach-in be a time of blessing, learning, and strategy for all of us. Thank you. Welcome. I'm delighted to first introduce Reverend Donald Register, who will serve as our co-moderator, as well as one of the panel speakers this evening. Reverend Register is a retired minister in the Presbyterian Church USA and a longtime civil rights activist and esteemed community leader with demonstrated long, lifelong commitment to fighting injustice. He and his wife Dolores have lived in Oak Park for 43 years and they raised their three sons here. A little later on in this evening's program, Reverend Register will share reflections on his personal experience of working for voter registration among African American community in Mississippi. In 1964, in January, while a resident of St. Louis, Missouri, Don responded to a call from the National Council of Churches and went as a volunteer to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where he participated in the voter registration drives. While there, he and eight other clergy were arrested and were held in Forest County Jail for nine days. Reverend Register is a former chair of the West Cook YMCA and is currently the treasurer of the Technical Assistance Corporation for Housing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Reverend Register to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. I'm honored to introduce our first teaching speaker this evening, Tamil Black, Jr., the Dean of the Chicago Civil Rights Movement. He is a revered and highly respected educator, political activist, community leader, oral historian, and philosopher. Tim's leadership in the African American community in Chicago was already well established when he heard the contingent, when he headed the contingent of nearly 300,000 Chicago's, Chicagoans to the 1963 March on Washington. As an organizer in labor and social justice movements of the 40s and 50s, Tim helped to establish the Congress for Racial Equality, or CORE as we know it also, and the United Packing House Workers of America, just a few more than 100 organizations that Tim has been active in over his distinguished 95 years. <laughs> Tim is now retired as a professor, of, a professor emeritus of social sciences at the Chicago College, City Colleges. His acclaimed two-volume book entitled Bridges of Memory, Chicago's First Wave of Great Immigration, chronicles black Chicago history from the 1920s to the present through interviews of great and small who were among the great migration. Several years ago, Tim donated his extensive collection of photographs, papers, and jazz recordings to future generations through the Chicago Public Library System. Tim Neil D. Black, Jr. papers are now housed at the Woodson Regional Library on the south side. His political activities have been continuous over seven decades as a candidate for alderman and state representative and as a leader in the progressive and political independent community. Many know him from his leadership in CORE, his support for Chicago Mayor Harold Washington, and his mentorship of a young community organizer named Barack Obama. <laughs> Even today, Tim remains active in progressive politics. His phone still rings from community leaders seeking counsel. In 2013, Tim became the first recipient of the City of Chicago's Champions of Freedom Award. Tim will share perspectives on at the overall progress made in civil rights, especially voting rights, over the last 75 years. Please join me in welcoming Professor Tamiel Black to the podium. Well, after that, what else can I say? Uh, and I'm awfully, very, very honored and proud to have this opportunity to say a few things. I didn't come to lecture. I'm not an academic, I'm not an intellectual or anything like that, but I've lived a long time. <laughs> and I can say uh, without much fear of contradiction or uh, anything of that sort, to all of you sitting here, even including these two young people sitting in the back, I used to be your age. <laughs> and so it's an honor to share some experiences. I'm not claiming to be an intellectual. Check it out. I'm not claiming to be an academic. Check it out. But I did live December the 7th will be 96 years of life. And I'm not prepared in, in a way to lecture, but to share. And the story goes like this. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, December the 7th, 1918. Take out your computers and you can figure that out. <laughs> Alabama, all of my ancestors, all of my grandparents, as far as I know and can track, had been enslaved. And they were brought, 
to this country in chains, not volunteering. They didn't volunteer. They were brought in chains and were labeled, as everyone in that period, as chattel slaves, property, not human beings. And so eventually my mother and father met and they married in Birmingham. I had an older sister and brother. So Alabama in the South at that time was quite a place. You scholars can go back and look and check it out. I was eight months old, the story goes. And I looked around at Birmingham at that time and I said to my mother, shit, I'm leaving here. <laughs> my mama said to my daddy, Dixie, this boy getting ready to leave here and he doesn't even know how to change his diapers. I'm going with him. <laughs> and so I brought my family <laughs> to Chicago when I was eight months old. At that point, in that period there, a month before we got here, there had been a race riot in Chicago, one of the most vicious of the time. And young men from World War, young African-American men from World War I were returning home after having been in the battles during World War I, some of them having suffered mustard gas when the Germans were experimenting. And so, they broke into the 8th Regiment Army, that's another long story, took out the rifles and began to fight back. That was the first time that had happened in American riot situations. But my family came in spite of that. They came during that period, during and right after World War I, like many families, and that can have an economic story if we had time to tell it. Many families, my father worked in a steel mill right outside of Birmingham, Bessemer, Alabama. The house where I was born is still there. My great-grandcousins have moved back after having lived in the North a long time. And so it wasn't poverty because most of the first great migration and these two volumes, volume one and volume two of Bridges of Memory, try to tell the stories, the oral history of three generations of African Americans who came to Chicago in the first great migration, roughly given dates from 1915 up until about 1950. These are all histories of people of those first generations, my generation, the generation of my children, and the generation of what would be my grandchildren, three grandchildren, not the second great migration. That's another story, which fits into what we're talking about in terms of voter registration and opportunity. And so they fled the South. They fled the terror of the South. They fled to be able to fight back if they were attacked. That happened later. They failed to be able to have quality education for their children. And most of those in my generation, in that first great migration, not only graduated from high school, most of us, but many of us and most of us went on to college or went into businesses in Chicago. I know that, that was 95 years, prove it to me. And primarily, to be able to vote, to be able to vote, they were denied the opportunity. Of course, women in general couldn't vote in that period. But black men with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment were denied the right to vote. And people like my father, who would try to go to vote, would be labeled and threatened, even though they wanted to enjoy. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all <laughs> they interpreted as human beings are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That was their attitude 
regardless to their status that had been pushed on them, their attitude was we are human beings and we're going to enjoy it. So in the South, if they tried it, they would be exterminated. They thought in the North. So they came North to Chicago for those three reasons. And I know as a matter of experience that in my household and across our neighborhood, when registration day and election day came, they would ask each other, did you register? And then did you vote? At that time, because the South was primarily Democrat, remember they, they had made that agreement after the Constitution was, when the Constitution was being, that, that they would have a certain, and the North was Republican, so most of those blacks who migrated during that period were Republicans. Because of the South, my mother would say, didn't Lincoln free the slaves? Well, that's a big story too. But <laughs> that fact did happen, but that was an urgent thing. And so that began to happen, but we voted. And then the army was segregated, segregated, running fast forward. And some of us went to service. I didn't volunteer, I was drafted. But many of my friends who volunteered to go into service were segregated, and we were segregated. And in Europe, they asked, why do we see Negro troop with white officers and never see, although they were just as prejudiced, never see any Negro commission officers over white troops? Why is that? My American feelings came up. My American, though I was black and being segregated in the army, with a uniform when I went south. I had on my uniform, I had to go to the back of the bus, although I failed to do that one time, I almost got into serious trouble, and didn't know, I didn't think about it. And if I was, went to buy something in the shopping, I, uh, I went into the store to buy it, and any white person, regardless to what they had, could come on and get in front of me in my soldier suit. I carried that, and there were many like me. And so when they made that comment about why do we see, I said to myself, without saying it to them, that ain't none of your damn business. We're going to straighten that crap out when we get back home. <laughs> there were many like that, not just blacks. Do not feel that the black struggle for equally, equal justice and all that has been sold in my blacks. No, 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 no. But that was the American spirit coming up in my feelings. And so running fast forward, though we had voted, we knew that our brothers and sisters in the South had not. We knew that we had been in a segregated army. And so when we came out of the army and it formed a new party called the Progressive Party. Moving fast forward, can't tell the whole story. Immediately, when we demanded in the Progressive Party, black and white and brown, that the President of the United States had to, by executive order, make segregation in the armed forces illegal or he wouldn't be president. And that's the reason that Harry Truman became scarcely the president in the 1948 election, I believe it was. Pardon the old man, you get to be my age, your memory isn't what it used to be. And so before the civil rights movement, there was activity, civil rights, civil liberties. But it became very, very intensified in the 40s and in the 50s and later in the 60s because it was evident with the reputation that was developing 
that the integrity of America was being jeopardized. And so we began to organize ADA, ACLU, uh, the uh, various voting groups across, and began to move out to have voter registration in the North to demand that there be equality in voter registration all over the United States, and carried that forward. And some of us went south, even though we were north, because we carried our southern heritage in our minds and hearts. And so when the group went south to Selma, Alabama, those of us who were Unitarian Universalists, or were Unitarian at that time, and lost a member of the Unitarian Church to violence in Selma, we Unitarians, along with our other friends, went to Selma, not to Pettus Bridge, this is after Pettus Bridge, and that's another big story. But we went because out of our experiences, both at home and abroad, we realized that the integrity of our country was in jeopardy. But the power that was needed to bring about change was imperative to all. If we were to have a democracy, it could not exclude people based on their gender, the race, or any other factor that was legal. They could not be deprived of the right as all others had. Why do they have a segregation as they are now doing it again in various, a more subtle way? That is to exclude groups of people from the opportunity to enjoy the power that, would, in, that carries their lives, that others will make those decisions about education, about the quality of health care, about safety, about all those factors that we human beings need in order to survive. Why would they do that? Because they can then say that these people are not capable, they are not able, they are not loyal. Use all of the defamatory remarks to discredit those people. How is it, what then, how do you do that? You can discredit them more easily by the color of their skin or by other factors that they have brought with them because of their heritage. And so voter registration and the opportunities to vote, the education as to whom to vote for is part of the challenge that you young people face. Because if I can't have it, and I have inherited the idea of equality, I'm going to keep on working until I have it, or maybe you don't have it either. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>